We've been talking a lot about Carl Jung lately, and a lot of you have been wanting to know more about Carl Jung. So we're going to be looking at Carl Jung's discovery of archetypes. A lot of people want to know, what are archetypes? And if you delve into Jung's work at all, they're going to come up a lot because they are extremely important dealing with the archetypes and the collective unconscious. And uh, the collective unconscious was one of the big uh, breaking points between Jung's relationship with Freud. So when we are, uh, dive into the idea of archetypes, which are very important, uh, we're going to see what really led Jung to discover them and what they are. Because archetypes can be a little confusing if you first encounter them. They have something to do with like symbols and mythological motifs and, you know, the all these different characters. Um, but then it also has something to do with your, you know, structure of the psyche. So it can be very confusing. Um, but they're actually very simple if one approaches it from uh, a very, you know, um, practical understanding of what they are and what they're for. So we're going to take a look at how Jung discovered archetypes, the kind of history behind there, and also a very easy way to understand archetypes and very importantly, why it matters, why you need to understand archetypes because it is very important because they're behind the scenes directing and controlling your life unbeknownst to you. All right, so what we're going to do is first we're going to take a look at sort of how archetypes were discovered by Carl Jung and then we're going to dive into what exactly archetypes are because as I said they're very mysterious sometimes hard to understand but we're going to unpack them and show how they're actually quite easy to understand and not as mysterious as uh, they may seem to be but can be understood and used to our advantages uh, our advantage so but before we do that we're going to look at um, how they were discovered by Carl Jung and I'm going to be um, taking some excerpts from a book called Jung's Map of the Soul by Murray Stein. It's a great book. I love this book. I read this book years and years and years ago. Um, if anyone is interested in studying Carl Jung, I highly recommend it if you're new. It's a great, great breakdown of Jung's uh, major uh, discoveries. So let me see if I can bring this on screen because I just have some excerpts that I'm reading from. I don't know if you can really see them or not, but it works. So, the origin of Jung's notion of archetypes can be traced back in his written works to the period between 1909 and 1912, when, while still collaborating with Freud, he was investigating mythology and writing Psychology of the Unconscious. In that work, he studied the fantasies of Miss Frank Miller, which had been made publicly available in a book published by his friend and colleague from Geneva, Gustave Flournoy. Jung wanted to explore the significance of these fantasies from his newly emerging point of view. So we have Jung here. Um, between 1909 and 1912, he was still collaborating with Freud because, um, if you're not, if you don't know, uh, Jung broke with Freud. Jung was a student of Freud, but they ended up breaking, having a big disagreement, and splitting ways. Um, and this was on Jung's part because he thought that Freud was way too obsessed with sex because Freud was, was you know, fantastic for founding, you know, psychoanal psychoanalytic theory. But he pretty much thought that everything was motivated by sex. And Jung was like, well, you know, sex is important, but it's not everything. And uh, yeah, today we look at that sort of, of having more to do with Freud's psyche than, than the psyche in general. Um, but also, Jung came up with the idea of the collective unconscious, we'll, which we'll be talking about today because uh, this deals with archetypes. They're related to the collective unconscious, and Freud did not like this. So they had major disagreements, and they split, uh, split ways, which is a good thing that, you know, Jung was able to come out from under the wing or shadow of Freud to uh, really flesh out his ideas because Jung's ideas were fantastic and, and revolutionary. So uh, Jung started studying these fantasies of someone named uh, Miss Frank Miller. And so what Jung wanted to do was explore what these fantasies that she was having could mean based on Jung's new ideas that Jung was coming up with. So Jung, Jung started, sort of wanted to step away from Freud's model and use his new model to start to examine the fantasies of this individual. And, you know, this is important for understanding his discovery of archetypes because this is a, you know, Jung in, in starting to develop his ideas, thinking thinking on his own two feet rather than relying on Freud, and, and starting to come up with new models of the psyche. And this is going to lead to his discovery of archetypes. So 
According to his autobiography, Jung got his first impression of impersonal layers of the unconscious from a dream he had during the voyage of America to America with Freud in 1909. Okay, so this is really important. So, um, according to uh, Jung's model, you have your consciousness, which is everything that you're consciously aware of, should be more or less self-explanatory, and then you have the personal unconscious, and, you know, this is where Freud's psychoanalytic theory came in because Freud was uh, basically putting forth the idea that problems in consciousness can arise from deep within your personal unconscious, things that have happened to you, your, 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 your hidden desires and repressed, um, repressed desires and things like that. So that's, you know, everything hidden within your personal unconscious. But Jung said there's another layer an impersonal layer. So at the personal unconscious, there's an impersonal layer called the collective unconscious. And that's what we're going to explore today because it has to do with archetypes, really important to archetypes. And uh, so, so if you've ever studied briefly psychology, they always have the iceberg metaphor, right? If you look at an iceberg in the water, they have uh, the tip of the iceberg, which is consciousness, and then underneath uh, the water, the rest of the iceberg is the personal unconscious. You know, very vast um, consciousness is just a little, little portion of it. So in Jung's model, uh, that still applies. But now imagine that there are many icebergs representing many different psyches, many different minds. All having the, the, the part that you can see, which represents consciousness, and then the unconscious, which is below the surface of the water. The collective unconscious would represent sort of the water itself. Because even though you have all these different icebergs, all these different psyches that are all unique and have personal data, different, different data, different experiences and repressed content in their personal unconscious, they all share the same water. The water is what connects them all together and the water all moves them all as well. Um, so this is going to play into uh, Jung's idea of the collective unconscious, which is um, elements of our our psyche that we all share. That's beyond just our personal unconscious, but it's the collective. Uh, so we'll we'll uh, unpack this more and see what what it has to do with archetypes. So Jung had this dream, and it's really interesting that he's he's making these discoveries through his dreams. So in the dream, he explores stories of the house. He's in a house. Oh, so he dreamed of a house called my house in the context of the dream that hid many levels. So he's, dream he's dreaming of a house of multiple stories. In the dream, he explores the stories of the house from the main floor, which represents the present age, down to the basement, which is the recent historical past, and beyond that, through several subcellars representing the ancient historical past, like the Greek and Roman, and finally, the prehistoric and Paleolithic past. This dream answered a question to what he had been asking during the trip, namely, on what premises is Freudian psychology founded? To what category of human thought does it belong? The dream image, he writes, became for me a guiding image for how to conceive of psychic structure. It was my first inkling of a collective a priori beneath the personal psyche. Okay, so what this means, first of all, in psychology, when you say psychic or psychic structure, doesn't have anything to do with mysticism, doesn't have anything to do with, you know, seeing ghosts and all that. Psychic just means relating to the psyche. That's all it means. So psychic structure is the structure of the psyche. So what Jung is saying, Jung, Jung had this uh, you know, dream about different layers of the house. And each layer, the deeper you went, was uh, further and further um, periods in the past. And the house was built on these multiple layers. So what Jung is going to put forward in his idea of the collective unconscious is that we all have our consciousness and then we all have our personal unconscious. But... What we all share is structures that we all have inherited and that we all share from all of these different past uh, experiences that we have had collectively um, through humanity. So 
what it means is that not only do we have our experiences as as people, right? You know, you, 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 you who you are is influenced by your surroundings and who you interact with as you grow up, your friends, your family, your peers, and your teachers, what's on TV. All this stuff is influencing you and shaping you. And based on this, you're doing certain things like repressing parts of yourself or whatnot. All, all this stuff is shaping you shaping your consciousness, and a lot of it's going into your personal unconscious in the form of repression and whatever. So what Jung is basically saying is that the collective uh, unconscious is sort of similar, but it's one that we all share together in that we are all shaped by, we, we basically as, as human beings, we don't come as blank slates. We come prepackaged a priori prior to, basically just meaning we come, not as blank slates, but prepackaged with all the different uh, like experiences and, 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 and events and um, influences that we as humanity uh, collectively went through as a past, through the past. So, um, you know, it's sort of like, uh, in a way, mental evolution. You, you see how when we're born, our, our avatars, our bodies have gone through this process of evolution and we are a product of, of evolution. Sort of the same, so, sort of the same similar, but on the mental level in that we have this whole uh, collective past that we all share together that makes up who we are. Um, be it, you know, like the Greek and Roman periods and the Egyptian and the prehistoric, Paleolithic, all these things um, come uh pre-packaged with us and we all share it together. You see, we can all have very, very different personal experiences. Maybe someone grew up in an extremely abusive household and someone else grew up uh, like the, 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 um, the offspring of a billionaire and they have a perfect life. These two individuals are going to have completely different personal unconscious, unconscious but they're going to share the same collective unconscious. Just like um, everyone has a human body, uh, but they can be very different, right? They're, but but they're more or less the same in structure, right? They all have, you know, two hands, two feet, and two eyes, you know, in, in, unless there's uh, some anomaly. But you know what I'm saying. So the collective unconscious kind of is similar to, to that. Uh, it's not a perfect metaphor, but you get what I mean. And that the collective is one that we all share together. This is going to make more sense. It might seem a little... Um, if it's your first, if it's your first time hearing it, it might seem a little strange because, you know, it's an idea that, that is not just thrown around very often. Um, but maybe, but maybe you've heard it before and, and, and it just clicks right away. But I'm, I'm assuming this is for uh, those who, who have never heard of this before. So it might seem a little weird at first, but let's continue and unpack it and we'll see what it has to do with, um, especially because what I'm going to eventually show the archetypes aren't that hard to understand. And uh, we're going to look at instincts. Instincts are a really easy way to understand archetypes. And you can kind of understand it in that way. In that, uh, you know, not, not perfectly, but we're all born. We all come with these instincts that we all share. Right? We all share these instincts together. Um, so that, we would say, um, the, the mental uh, complement of those instincts, the mental portion that goes along with those instincts, are part of the collective unconscious because we all share. That's something we all share. We might have very different experiences in life, but we all share these these instincts. It'll become clear uh, if it's not. Let's let's just continue though. So there was the much larger issue of the whole course of human evolution and development. And Jung was theorizing that sexual libido had in the course of eons of human evolution been channeled into pathways of culture through metaphors and likenesses, at first then into deeper transformations. These could no longer adequately be defined in the least as sexual. So the reason why it's talking about sexuality is because Freud was obsessed with sex, basically thought everything had to do with it. Um, and uh, Jung was like, well... No, there, there are other there are other things. So that's why they're referencing that sex. Um, so I mentioned instincts is a very simplistic example of archetypes, but they become much fuller and much richer, as we will see, 
and uh, they represent themselves in the form of myths, symbols, and legends. And, and again, if that makes sense to you, awesome. But if it doesn't, I completely get it. If it's your first time hearing it, it can be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, you were just talking about instincts. Now you're talking about the myths, symbols, and legends. What do they have to do with each other? Uh, we'll get to that. I, um, I just want to give you the background first. Then we'll really dive into what they are. And it's, it, it, it's, it's relatively simple. So um, the outlined constellation of the hero myth. Uh, oh, so he outlined the constellation of the hero myth and assigned to the hero the role of creating consciousness. All right, so this is really important here. Okay, so you you have you have a hero myth, and uh, you you find hero myths all over the place. You can think of like King Arthur and the Round Table is a hero myth. Um, you know, there's that hero that that has to like fight the dragon and overcome odds. Star Wars. Um, someone in the chat had mentioned earlier Star Wars is a great example of the hero myth. You have Luke Skywalker, who's the hero who has to defeat, you know, the shadow and 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 confront Darth Vader and, and overcome and become more actualized at the end. You know, he starts off as a, a basic, you know, everyday sort of human. But then he confronts his dark side. You know, he's tempted by the dark side. Uh, he overcomes it and starts to become a more fully actualized person. At the end, he's this great Jedi. Now, Star Wars isn't super healthy because the light side and the dark side are they should, you know, it, it's it's it's. Not going to get into too much, but um, Star Wars is very fractured in that, you know, you have the light side. that's all about good and love and peace. And you have the dark side, which is all about hate, anger and aggression. Um, and really, this is a very fractured psyche. A, a true psyche would be integrated uh, where you would have both functions uh, working together in harmony and unison in a healthy way. But so even there, though, even in my mentioning that, can you start to see how these symbols represent structures in your psyche in a story form so you can have the idea of your consciousness going through a transformation facing its shadow its repressed contents and then at the end of all this you know uh journey of of, of learning and understanding and confronting one's inner demons inner repressed content you become a more fully actualized person so do you see it's 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 a psychic meaning mind, mental uh, journey that all of us go through in some way or another. It's part of the human experience going through this growth, but we can understand it in the form of a myth like Star Wars. So um, it can be kind of confusing at first because uh, Jung is not always the clearest in his writing, um, but but this is where you get the idea of you have this when it comes down to it, what archetypes are, are these structures of mind. They are patterns of being, mental patterns, that we as humanity all share together as part of the collective because we all go through it. We all, we all go through more or less um, a, certain, a certain journey like that. It's a certain mental program that we go through um, and experience in life. We all share it, it's collective. Um, we all might do it in different ways and then we can experience these or and then we can represent this journey uh, through stories and myths like Star Wars is an example of a myth that represents the hero's journey which is just a human having the experience of going through life and uh, integrating their psyche um, so basically what, what, what Jung is saying when it comes to archetypes is if you look at history, and you look at all these stories like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table or um, Jung was really into even like Gnosticism and alchemy. If you look at all these uh, myths and symbols and stories and legends, what Jung wants to say is these stories are actually just projections of people's psychic structures, their mental structures. So he's not even necessarily saying that they did so consciously. They just wrote these stories because, you know, they wanted to express them. But Jung is saying that these stories were expressed in the way that they were because they reflect this unconscious pattern that we all share together. So, for example, in alchemy, 
uh, you have this idea of transmuting base metal into gold. And you, uh, you know, you're, you're supposed to subject uh, this base metal to different purifying methods like fire to remove the impurities from the metal to finally get perfect gold. And so Jung would say something, you know, along the lines of, well, this actually represents uh, a mind going through the process of actualization. You have a mind, the base metal, going through trials that are difficult, subjecting to fire, to remove the impurities, to become a more healthy, uh, more whole individual. And finally, you have gold. Finally, you become an actualized individual. So that's just one example. You know, Star Wars is another example. Um, Knights of, you know, King Arthur is another example. So Jung is basically saying you have these different archetypal patterns that we all share. Archetypes are just mental programs. That's it. That's what they are. They are mental programs that can be expressed through stories, symbols, and metaphors. So we're going to even break this down even more, but I just want to get across that it really is, you know, it, it's a complex idea, but in the end, it's fairly simple. They are mental programs, these archetypes that are part of the collective unconscious, meaning we all share them and go, th we all go through them. It's the human experience. Uh, and they can be expressed through myths and stories, and they have been throughout history. And Jung is saying that if you study these stories, you can sort of see where humanity was developing uh, in their psyche at that time in history by examining the stories, because these stories are ultimately just projections of their unconscious or, or the collective unconscious. Um, so so the, the hero myth assigned to the hero the role of creating consciousness. The hero is a basic human pattern. Characteristic of women equally as, as of men, so it doesn't matter, uh, gender or sex doesn't matter. So the hero is a basic human pattern that demands sacrificing the mother, meaning a passive childish attitude, and assuming the responsibilities of life and meeting reality in a grown-up way. So you have this idea, right, the story of the hero who sacrifices the mother, right? So the hero leaves home to go on a quest, let's say, in this story. The hero leaves home to go on a quest. What this means, the hero is a basic human pattern, and the leaving home or sacrificing the mother means uh, leaving behind a passive childish attitude, You're, the, the development of the psyche, and assuming responsibilities of life and meeting reality in a grown-up way. The hero archetype demands leading off, leaving off with childish fantasy thinking and insists on engaging reality in an active way. You see? So these stories are just ways of representing common patterns that we all share together. This idea of growing up, you know, uh, leaving behind um, childish attitudes to assume the responsibilities of an adult life. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with fantasizing. That's awesome. But you know what I mean. Um, you have to grow up at some point and not just live in a world of fantasy. And 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 this is a this is a, a human pattern that we all go through. We all go through this. We all go through these different stages in life. These stages of you know being a child and adolescence and um, uh, you know coming into adulthood and all these different marks of of being a human. We all go through. And it can be represented in myths like the hero leaving um, the the household or, you know, Luke Skywalker's uh, parents being killed, I believe, right? The stormtroopers, Luke Skywalker's parents being killed and him going on a journey. He's leaving behind his old childish self to become a powerful Jedi where he's going to have to confront his dark side. So there are these patterns that we all share together. Um, if humans had not been able to take up this challenge, they would have been doomed eons ago. So you see, this is, this is a product of evolution as well. These archetypal patterns 
are, are products of mental evolution. So they develop because they are necessary for our survival. Um, if humans didn't have this pattern, they would have been doomed eons ago, right? If you just if you didn't have this pattern of of, of leaving behind a passive childish attitude and and assuming adult responsibility, if if humans didn't have that pattern inbuilt within them to 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 uh, actualize, they would have been eaten by you know, they would have been eaten by predators because they would have been living in their fantasy land. They never would have grown up and learned how to defend themselves. And and so you see how these archetypal patterns are products of evolution. So in order to meet reality consistently, though, a tremendous sacrifice of desire and wistful longing for the comforts of childhood is demanded. This was mis and, and I just real quick as an aside, the reason why I'm um, you know putting so much emphasis on explaining this is because this type of when we start getting into archetypes and structures of the mind and all this, different personality types will understand this in a different way. So um, for example, uh, someone who is like intuitive and, and and feeling may may just get this right away. Like, oh yeah, this makes total sense. But some um, someone who's more of like um, in intuitive thinking, it might be a little harder because you 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 hit that point where um, for intuitive thinkers, it's 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 symbols and metaphors are a little more more difficult. Like it's too it's too vague. Like they want something very um, analytical and tangible to hang on to, rather than these stories and dreams and myths and legends. It's like okay, but what is the actual like? What's the mechanism here? So what I'm trying to do is um, make this easily digestible for for any type of personality type. So I want to give you know the uh, the people who understand um, you know intuitive feeling uh, uh, types to show how this is expressed through myth and legend and story and dreams and it's awesome. And then the um, for the more analytical uh, thinkers that these are just mental programs that have evolved over time. Uh, via evolution for our survival and can be expressed through myths and stories and legends. Uh, let's see. So this was Miss Miller's dilemma because remember, this is still Jung discovering, you know, he, Jung is coming up with these new ideas. He just left Freud and uh, he's, he's studying Miss Miller's fantasies and he's like, all right, so I want to sort of put Freud's model behind, and I want to apply my model to this. I want to start studying this with with what I think about the psyche and reality. So here was um, Miss Miller's dilemma, the individual he was studying. She was confronted with the task of growing up and meeting her adult roles in life, and she was shrinking from the challenge. She was not leaving fantasy thinking behind, and she was getting lost in a morbid, unreal world that was relatively unrelated to her reality. She was in a massive regression to the mother. And the question was, would she get stuck there like Theseus in Hades and never return? Jung was not so sure, but he guessed she might fall into psychosis. So he's looking at this individual who's, who's um, you know, having these uh, like hallucinations or whatnot um, and getting lost in the unreal world. And basically, Jung is, is, is showing that, well, she's not completing this archetypal pattern that has developed f across humanity. She's getting, she's getting stuck in that fantasy realm of the, of the child, and she's getting stuck in an unreal world. So you see how Jung is now applying his model and going, she's not completing this, these stages that have developed across humanity. She's getting stuck in one of them. This is the issue. This is the problem. And so if you were using Jung model, Jung's model, You'd want to, you know, uh, perhaps help this person try and move uh, to the proper stage. Um, as he worked on these fantasies of uh, Miss Miller, Jung brought a host of related myths, fairy tales, and religious motifs from remote corners of the world to interpret her images. By the way, and, and as um, Jung just mentioned, you know, religious motifs as well. I want you to recognize it well. If you, if you look at the different world religions and whatnot, uh, you'll notice that a lot of them share a lot of certain motifs in common, even though they might have developed, uh, you know, on different parts of the world, um, in different cultures. They might have different characters, different names, but a lot of them share certain similarities. 
And again, this is because it's a uh, projection of um, either the psyche or the actual structure of existence. Um, so if you look, I don't know if anyone, well, if you're watching my channel, you're probably familiar with Gnosticism a little bit. So Jung looked at the Gnostic myth where, you know, you have the Pleroma, which is the realm of the divine light. And then um, from that realm of divine light and pure thought, an impure evil thought gets born known as Yaldabaoth, the Demiurgos. And this 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 uh, um, uh, being declares himself. He thinks that he is the one true God. And he ends up fashioning earth, which is more like hell and trapping souls there. But anyway, Jung looked at this and he he thought, oh, this is a projection of the psyche. The... Um, the uh, Pleroma represents the higher self, and then Yeldebeoth, uh, the Demiurgos, represents the ego, because the ego thinks it's the true God and, and no one else is. So this is like the ego thinking that, oh, I'm real, but not realizing that the higher self is what you truly are, that the self is what you are, not the ego. The ego is just the servant of the self. Uh, we'll see the ego actually, we'll talk about the ego, um, actually has the higher self as its core. Um, but anyway, that's how, you know, Jung would, would represent, um, talk about Gnosticism as the Pleroma being the higher self and Yeldebaoth being the, uh, representing the ego. And one thing that I want to point out here too is, uh, remember in Hyperionism, um, we, we respect Jung very much and, and we definitely use, um, some of Jung's ideas, but we don't necessarily agree with everything that Jung has to say. Um, but I want to point out that uh, I'll, I'll talk about this later, um, perhaps. Um, I'm definitely going to talk about it in the, in the new book that I'm writing as well. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, when we start studying dreams and and uh, like religious motifs or whatever, any of these symbolis, uh, symbol, uh, symbolism in our dreams or whatever, ultimately when it comes down to it, it doesn't really matter if it's true or not. It matters if it helps you, if, it, if you get something out of it. Now, if you're trying to understand the nature of reality, it matters if things are true or not true. But if you are trying to simply, uh, like say, integrate your psychic structure, at some point, if you have a certain dream and there are certain symbols of your, in your dream and you go, oh, you know, this um, man must represent my father, which represents my father's, uh, the fatherly side of myself. And uh, I haven't integrated that part and I, and I should. It doesn't really matter if that, if your dream really did, represent your father maybe it was just more maybe you just dreamt about your father because you, you saw him a couple days ago or something but if it helped you learn something new about yourself by understanding it in that way that's what's important if it helped you grow and actualize as a person that's what's important um, but anyway i'm getting a little off track here and that's more to do with hyperionism um, but, but I'll talk about that more later because it's really fascinating when it comes to dreams and all this sort of things your dreams are highly symbolic highly filled with meaning. But I get a lot of people going, you know, coming to me and going, well, how do I know that this really means this? And, and what if it means this thing? And when it comes down to it, it's, it's ultimately what helps you grow and interpreting it in the way that helps you unlock new understandings and revelations about yourself. And there's a whole process and method to do that, which I um, will talk about uh, in another place. But anyway, I'm getting way off track. I just think it's really interesting to understand this and, and see how we have these archetypal patterns showing up everywhere. So um, let's let's go back. Let's let's zoom back towards uh, archetypes here. So so he so Jung, as he was studying um, the fantasies of Miss Miller, he was looking at all these myths and fairy tales and religious motifs from all over the world to interpret her images, the things she was say, seeing or whatnot, her, her, the unreal world that she got trapped in. So he was awestruck by these amazing parallels and his mind groped for an explanation of why this woman had spontaneously produced images and themes resembling those of Egyptian mythology and of the Aboriginal tribes of Australia and of the native peoples of America. Why do such striking parallels occur to the human mind without much seeming effort? And what does this mean? So he's looking at the her dream content or whatever that the that she's having, and he's like, these are extremely similar 
to 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 things in relating to Native American uh, beliefs or uh, Egyptian mythology. They're extremely similar. And it's like why? Why is this the case? And and well, the answer is because uh, what his conclusion was: these archetypal patterns are ones that we all share. We all share them, and so of course they're going to be uh, uh, similar. Um, you know, again, instincts are always a really easy way to understand this. If you ever get lost, in my opinion, at least, we all share instincts. So it, it, it'd be like, oh, wow, it's really weird that that person over there gets scared when they see a bear. And that person over there, they get scared when they see a lion. Well, that's weird. Well, it's because we all share this um, in, in, inherent instinctual attribute collectively. Um, th th those are real simplified versions of it, of of you know, getting scared of a bear, <laughs> have, you know, having your uh, f sympathetic nervous system um, activate in in response to a threat is a lot more basic than the complex journey of a human being leaving behind childhood and taking on res adult responsibilities. But it's the same that we all share them. Um, so, so, so how come, you know, there were all these different connections he wanted to know. So he connected these facts to his dreams, his dream of the descending basements. And thus he began to realize that he was discovering evidence for the existence of a collective layer of the unconscious. This was new it's because we, you know, through Freud, Freud, we were about the consciousness and the personal unconscious. And he's like, wow, there's a layer below that, the collective unconscious. If we look in the deep basement, we see that we're all connected by this, uh, these collective patterns that go much deeper than even our personal experiences and our personal content. Uh, this would mean that there is material in the unconscious that has not been put there by repression from consciousness. It is there to begin with. So that's the thing. Like in Freud's psychoanalytic theory, you have the conscious and the unconscious, and the unconscious is filled with things that were repressed. You know, like you're growing up and let's say you um, have uh, an anger issue and um, people tell you, no, it's bad to be angry all the time and you get reprimanded and punished. So you take that part of yourself and you repress it and it becomes part of your unconscious. So your unconscious becomes this reservoir for all different aspects of you that get repressed. And so Jung is going, wait, the unconscious is, is not just containing these repressions but there's all this other material stemming from the collective unconscious that's there from the very beginning. The human mind has universal structures, just like the human body. So just like each and every single one of us has a body, uh, but it all turns out differently. We all have different bodies, but we more or less have the same universal structure and pattern. Same thing with the psyche, that are, that it's there from the very beginning. Just like the human body goes through this development period that we all share, the mind goes through this development period and patterns that we all share collectively. So um, the mind has universal structures and these can be discovered through an interpretive and comparative method, thought and reaching. Um, so this is, uh, you know, why, you know, Jung was so obsessed with studying myths and dreams and stories and legends because he sees all this as a projection of the collective unconscious and things that can be learned um, from these. So uh, we are, um, so, so there are so many different archetypes, right? Which are universal collective patterns that we all share. And let me just read to you this real quick. By the way, that, what, we were, what I was just reading from is Murray Stein's Jung's Map of the Soul. Great book, highly recommend it. Uh, just throwing that out there. If anyone wants to know more about Jung, really great. So, um, although there are many different archetypes, Jung defined 12 primary types that symbolize basic human motivations. Each type has its own set of values, meanings, and personality traits. Also, the 12 types are divided into three sets of four, namely ego, soul, and self. The types in each set share a common driving source, for example, ego uh, example types within the ego set are driven to fill ego-defined agendas, and these twelve archetypes are the innocent, everyman, hero, outlaw, explorer, creator, ruler, magician, lover, caregiver, jester, and sage. 
And I think this is the part where um, the, the analytical thinkers get a little thrown off by this because they're like, whoa, what, what? You're talking about jesters and magicians and like, what's going on here? Um, whereas uh, someone more feeling intuitive, you know, kind of gets it right away. Um, maybe. Uh, but the idea here is, is again, it's, it's fairly simple. Is that the innocent, the everyman, the hero, the outlaw, the explorer, these all just represent different mental patterns. And we're just giving them a name and an image and a symbol uh, to represent them in a story form. But they're just structures of the mind, kind of like, you know, if you have a computer, you have different programs running in the background doing a lot of different things. So if you had, let's say, named, you named the different programs, right? You named the program uh, Photoshop and you named the other program, you know, like... Um, Microsoft Word. So you have these different programs of the mind, and we name them the everyman, the hero, the outlaw, the explorer. They all have different um, purposes. They all have different um, uh, motivations. And um, uh, it, 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 and, and they all are shared collectively. They're all, all of us share these um, as collective patterns. So just kind of like computers all have, you know, similar programs that they need to run. Uh, you know, you don't need Word and Photoshop for them to run, but there are certain, there are certain things, there are certain um, code structures that every computer has necessary for it to run. Kind of like that. Um, all computers share that. So I'm trying to give a mix of analytical examples and also mystical, uh, mythological examples for, for everyone to sort of latch onto here. But so... Um, it, uh, I know I've been talking for a while already, so I, I want to make sure that we get to everything that we want to talk about today. But if you guys at some point would like, let me know in the comments, um, especially in the replay. Let me know in the replay comments because I can't really see this the comments right now while I'm live. But in the replay comments, let me know if you want a video where we explore all these different archetypes, like the in innocent, the everyman, the hero, the outlaw, the explorer, the magician. Let me know if you want a video on those. Um, and then you can see, you can even see as we identify them, which one you relate to the most, which one you most um, connect with. Um, so if you want one on that, let me know. We can do so. But let's continue um, breaking down archetypes a little more. Hopefully you're starting to get, you know, a pretty good grasp on them and, and, and realizing that they're, they're not that difficult to understand. And real quick, I want to mention um, that the main archetypes that we deal with in Hyperianism are the shadow self and then what we call the mirror self and the power self. And the idea is, is that these are all programs that run in your mind, uh, but they, they, they act almost like their own personalities. And that's why Jung gives them more, you know, anthropomorphic sort of forms because they act like their own personalities in that they have their own agendas. Like the shadow self wants you to you know, if, if it's filled with addiction, it, 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 it wants you to fulfill its, its desire for that substance or whatever it is. They all, there are all these different sort of personalities. That's why this video says discovering your secret selves, because you have all these different archetypal patterns, which act like personalities because they're all these programs and, and they have the, they're so, not literally, they're not literally other beings, but they are so organized um, in that they are their own programs that they um, operate as if they were. And they have their own agendas, their own goals, and they often conflict with each other. They often, and this is, in Hyperionism, this is why we want to learn how to work with all of them and integrate them together so that they're working together in harmony. Because right now, most people are completely unaware that they're there. They're just running in the background and fighting with each other. And, and this leads to depression and addiction and um, all sorts of mental uh, issues. What one needs to do is discover them and then begin to integrate and deal with them so that they're working together in harmony. It'd be kind of like if you had a computer where all the programs were running, but they were conflicting with each other. They were all trying to do certain things that would get in the way of the other one. Your, your computer would be incredibly buggy. And what you'd want to do to fix that computer is to go into the code and um, make sure that the programs are running in a way where they're not uh, running into contradictions and competing with each other. So that's essentially the process of individuation in Jungian terms, but the process of uh, integration and inner star actualization in Hyperion terms, where we work with these three major archetypes, the power self and the mirror self, 
um, and the shadow self. And you see these archetypes are um, universal in that we all have them, but they're mental structures. That's what they are. They are mental programs that we all have and we want to make sure that they're running and working well together. Um, so uh, interesting idea as well. Um, there are these, uh, I want to talk about um, real quick, real quick. I just want to throw something kind of cool in here before we dive into a little more of this. Um, and that is the idea of complexes. So it's really interesting. So you have, let's say, um, you know, like the higher self. The higher self is an archetype. It's interesting that the ego is actually a complex. Um, and it, really what a complex is, it's not that different from an archetype because it's still a mental program. It's just, so let me explain. A complex, let's take the ego for example, has at its core an archetype. So the ego has the archetypal core of the higher self or the self in Jungian terms, and then sort of uh, orbiting it or, or, or what the complex is formed by is all your, you know, experiences, your um, understanding of self, your um, like everything that it means to that you identify with you as your ego, you growing up and having a mother and a father and the friends that you have, your experiences. You see all that sort of orbits around the core of the higher self and forms your ego. Does that sort of make sense? You have all these personal experiences that sort of, you know, you can kind of imagine them like collecting and clumping up around uh, the core of the higher of, of the self, the higher self, and that becomes your ego because you think, oh, I am, you know, um, uh, Jeremiah and my mother is, you know, so and so and so and so, and I have this friend and I am a baker. But that, you know, that's you as the ego. Your true eternal self is not that. Um, and that's who you are at your core. And this egoic uh, complex has formed. Um, so, anyway, but you see, a complex is still a mental program, it just has a more foundational program at its core. So anyway, it's going a little beyond what, what I meant to talk about today, but I don't know. I get, I get kind of excited about these things. I just think they're cool ideas and I want to throw them in there to share, get you thinking about it. But I want to real quick before we um, sort of wrap this up here is, is uh, we, uh, there's something really important that I want to talk about. Okay. So let's, let's look at, cause I want to really nail down what an archetype is. So when people talk about archetypes, you, you know what it is 100%. And that's why I want to jump into instincts because instincts, the mental uh, reflection of an instinct is a really basic archetype. And I think it's a really good way to get a good grasp on, on what archetypes are. So um, so is this a quote by Jung? No, I don't, I don't know if this is or not. Anyway, no, this is not a quote by Young, but uh, I don't, I got this from an article somewhere. Um, instincts function very precisely because they are guided by images and shaped by patterns. Okay, this is, all right, go with me here because this is going to be, this is going to connect and it's, 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 it's cool. All right. So instincts function very precisely because they are guided by images and shaped by patterns. The patterns, very important, which also constitute the meaning of the instinct. At this point in his essay, Jung links archetypes, the basic mental patterns, with instincts. Okay, so Jung is, is linking archetypes, mental patterns, with instincts. And these are going to be real sort of basic, basic instinct, uh, basic archetypes. So the archetypes aren't the instincts themselves. What the archetypes are is they trigger the instinct. They are the psychic counterpart, psychic just meaning psyche, mental. They are the mental counterpart of the instinct. Um, so let me explain. So the basic mental patterns, oh uh, yeah. So instincts are guided and oriented by archetypal images. On the other hand, however, archetypes can behave like instincts to the extent that the archetypes intervene in the shaping of conscious contents by regulating, modifying, and motivating them. They act like the instincts. It is therefore very natural to suppose that these factors, 
the archetypes are connected with the instincts and to inquire whether the archetype uh, while, while the typical situational patterns which these collective form principles uh, apparently represent are not in the end identical with the instinctual patterns namely with the patterns of behavior so they're not identical but they're um, i'll explain more so carl jung understood archetypes as universal archaic patterns and images that derive from the collective unconscious and are the psychic counterpart of instinct. Just if we, so this now is a, these, now what I'm going to read are actually quotes by Jung. Just if we have been compelled to postulate the concept of an instinct determining or regulating our conscious actions, so in order to account for the uniformity and regularity of our perceptions, we must have recourse to the correlated concept of a factor determining the mode of apprehension. It is this factor, which I call the archetype or primordial image. The primordial image or archetype might suitably be described as the instinct's perception of itself or as the self-portrait of the instinct in exactly the same way as consciousness is an inward perception of the objective life process. Just as conscious apprehension gives our actions form and direction, so unconscious apprehension through the archetype determines the form and direction of the instinct. Okay, that last sentence, really important. Just as conscious apprehension gives our actions form and direction, so we're conscious self-aware beings, and our conscious self-awareness, our mental faculties, give our physical selves form and direction. I consciously decide I am hungry and I want to go to the fridge and thus I compel my body to get up, stand and walk over to the fridge. Our conscious apprehension gives our actions form and apprehension. Okay, so now thinking about instincts. So unconscious apprehension. So instead of it being conscious, when we unconsciously apprehend through the archetype, through a mental program, uh, this determines the form and direction of the instinct. And we'll get back to that in just a minute. But now the collective unconscious consists of the sum of the instincts and their correlates, the archetypes. Just as everybody possesses instincts, so everyone also possesses a stock of archetypal images. So really... You know, archetypes are as easy to understand as, as instincts. Just like everyone has instincts collectively, universally, we all have archetypal images. We all have archetypes. We all have mental programs. Um, archetypes are typical modes of apprehension. And wherever we meet with uniform and regularly recurring modes of apprehension, we are dealing with an archetype, no matter whether it's mythological, no matter whether it's mythological character is recognized or not. So, and then this is really important. Thus, the yucca moth must carry within it an image, as it were, of the situation that triggers off its instinct. This image enables it to recognize the yucca flower and its structure. So he's giving a, a good example here. This is an example by Jung. So you have this moth. It's flying around. And it has the archetypal image or the mental program that allows it to recognize the specific flower, um, which will trigger its instinct. So the, the, the archetypal programs... The, uh, the mental counterpart of the instincts are which trigger the instinct. So let me give you another really basic example. Um, if you're walking through a forest, you see a bear, you uh, fight or flight kicks in. The, that, that instinctual fight or flight kicks in. Um, you, you didn't have to consciously recognize that bear either if, uh, if, if, if you were unconscious. Um, you would have still, that still would have kicked in. You know, an in, in animal encountering the bear that, that has that instinct will, will also. So if you think of like two, um, like maybe if something is 
like a gnat flies by your face or something and you just, you know, reach up to smack it or something. You're not even doing it consciously. You just automatically, you see, oh, something's coming at my face. I'm going to hit it. You're not even doing it consciously at that point because at the end you might be like, oh, man, I must have looked really stupid. Why did I do that? Uh, I, I, I just did it unconsciously. So the idea here is so you have this archetypal uh, image rather this or, you know, mental program that allows you to recognize the threat, which then triggers the sympathetic nervous system to activate and you uh, have the flight or fight instinct kicked in, kick in. So. Um, so basically, right, it's really easy to understand you, you are, you know, if, if the, the, uh, archetype, the mental program is what allows you to recognize that structure as a threat and kick in the instinct of fight or flight to trigger the sympathetic nervous system. So you, cause you know, there's more going on than just you simply apprehending the bear. There's more going on than you just having the the raw, not even raw, but there's more going on than just you having the sensory data of the bear. If you didn't have that archetypal um, pattern, if you didn't have that mental program, and, and let's say you weren't conscious and, and you haven't learned about bears and all that, right? Um, you would, uh, you would... Um, have uh you that 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 instinct wouldn't trigger that instinct wouldn't trigger now i i want to make it really really clear that this example that i'm giving is not a good example um because we're talking about um you know certain learned behavior uh, especially when it comes to humans and like babies and uh like humans humans instincts act a lot different than other animals instincts um babies are like pretty helpless um they have to have a lot of learned behavior um, they're not as uh, instinctual as um, other creatures, right? Other creatures can just sort of be born. They have all these instincts. They can recognize danger and all that. Uh, babies, not so much. So um, don't don't take what I'm giving as a perfect example, but I, I think it can it can help you um, get the idea. If you just imagine a being in general, just a being, not a human or whatever, just a being that just sees the bear, if it doesn't have that um, mental program, it's just gonna see it and it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna do anything about it. But that archetypal mental program is what allows it to recognize the bear as something that will then trigger the uh, sympathetic nervous system to go off. So that's why um, Jung uses a much better example. It's just a little more complex, uh, but but it's a much better example of the moth. So you have the situation where you have the moth and it carries with it the archetypal mental program that allows it to recognize the structure of the flower, triggering its instinct to go to that flower. So um, all of us have these, and, and I think that that's, you know, a fairly easy way to understand these very basic archetypes. Just like we all have instincts, we all have these archetypes. They're simply mental programs. Uh, instincts have the mental counterpart of these basic archetypes. And then there are just more advanced archetypes, like the archetypal pattern of leaving the mother and, um, uh, uh, you know, um, leaving, hood, uh, leaving behind childhood fantasies to become an adult with responsibilities and etc. These are just more complex patterns and they're collective because we all share them and they get translated into myths, stories, and legends. And um, it's critically important to be able to work with these archetypes because they're within you and they sort of all have their own personalities like programs running on their own agenda. You wanna make sure that they're working together healthily because if not, you're going to have a, you know, run into problems with like either addiction or anger, or depression or all these different issues. And most of the problems we have in the world today come from the world's collective not being integrated and it being the sum of all its people. You know, that's why we have all these wars and bloodshed and hate, homophobia, sexism, racism, all that. It's because you have these archetypes of the shadow being repressed content or mirror uh, self, which which uh, has to do with gender and also opposites, 
Um, and then the power self, which has to do with like authority. You have all these things that aren't integrated. There's projection going on. There's possession happening. And the world is just fractured. The world represents a fractured psyche. You can look at the world as a whole, like a psyche, that, that, that are its own archetypes, all fighting, fighting each other because they all have their own agendas. You know, you could look at different nations um, as being different archetypes uh, within the universal structure of, or, uh, of the earth and uh, as archetypes having their own agenda and, and fighting with each other. It's very, you know, it's 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 uh, very similar, you know, because you have these different nations with sort of their own personalities and own culture, culture, with their own agendas and conflicting with others. Um, but really, guess what? They're all part of the one Earth, and so it should all be unified and working together, not fighting and causing hatred, war, bloodshed, murder, all this bullshit. Uh, so same thing with your individual psyche. You have all these archetypal programs within you. They all kind of have, have their own agendas. And uh, just like a, a fractured, distorted, self-annihilating earth, your psyche will be in a similar s situation of distress until you go in, recognize that they're there and start correcting them and dealing with them and integrating them in a way so that they're all working together in a unified way so that you can live a happy and healthy life. And that's what uh, Hyperionism Interstar Actualization is all about. And that's what ultimately uh, we want to do with the world as well um, in creating a new earth is an earth that is unified uh, mentally so that it can also be unified physically as well. And we don't have to have all these atrocities that are happening every day. So let's always move one step closer towards unity. If you're watching the replay, please let me know if you want to see more videos about Jung or psychology in general. Tell me in the comments uh, because there's so much more we could talk about so much more. Um, and if you enjoy these types of videos, let me know. Tell me in the comments so that uh, and I will uh, uh, create them. I want to give a big shout out to everyone that supports on Patreon, especially Trent, Cassidy, Renaissance Fairy, Michael, Evie, Alan, Angela, Maria, Brian, and John. And I want to give a special shout out to Maria because I didn't realize that Maria had been supporting at the gold tier for many months, but it was in a different currency, so it didn't notify me correctly on Patreon. So I'm terribly sorry about that, Maria. Big shout out to Maria. Thank you so much for the support, and I apologize for not having you on there, um, but but you certainly are now, and I appreciate the support very much. And if any of you out there have ever felt like, uh, you know, you've learned something or gotten something from my videos, consider supporting on Patreon. The link will t uh, pop up right over here. Helps out a lot. It's how I'm able to do these live streams and write my books and make these videos. Um, so if, if you uh, do enjoy my work, consider supporting um, and you get access to our weekly secret live streams and hidden Discord server, The Citadel. And I appreciate it very much.